Got uh, me, myself, for the record, Stephen Welch, of the Capital Program Committee, and I'd like to confirm access. Uh, I'll start with uh, staff, um, Rick Sears. Here. And um, Allie. She's muted. Um, and Terry. Who I've talked to both. I'm here. Okay, great, thanks. And Andrew, uh, you'll be speaking. I've heard you, Charles, Charlie. Yes. And Rob, we've heard too. Okay, great. Uh, members, uh, Richard Hussey. Here. Uh, Peter McEachern. Here. And Pete Kaiser. Here. And myself. And um, I'll announce if I see people as I see people coming in. Um, great. So uh, this open meeting of the Capital Program Committee is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order, March 12th, 2020. That order posted with agenda materials for this meeting allows public bodies to convene remotely so long as public access to deliberations is reasonably provided. This meeting is convening via Zoom with video and audio recording and broadcast via YouTube on the town's YouTube channel. With no member of the public having asked to speak, this particular meeting will not feature public comment. Materials provided to members for the meeting or provided during the meeting are unless otherwise noted available on the town's website, the Capcom. Uh, good morning, Christy Kickham. Good morning. Um, during the meeting, I'll introduce the agenda topics and speakers. Please remember to mute your Zoom audio until your name is called and let's direct comments and questions through the chair to avoid crosstalk and make taking of the minutes easier. Lastly, formal votes, if any, will be conducted via roll call. Uh, with that said, we'll move on to the meeting. Um, and I'll call this uh, meeting of the Capital Program Committee to order Thursday, October 22nd at shortly after 10 a.m. Uh, can I get a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Uh, Richard, on your motion. Aye. Peter McEachern. Aye. Uh, Christy Kickham. Aye. Peter Kaiser. Aye. And I'm an aye. Great. Uh, no audio video. I uh, did the audio vis video announcement, no public comment. Uh, so this morning we're going to review uh, Police Marine and the DPW Transportation. These are all uh, projects that have been before us previously. So um, what I'll do, and with no new members currently sitting, uh, to the extent we can expedite the meeting, uh, you all, uh, Rob, uh, Charlie and uh, Andrew are welcome to talk at length, but we've reviewed these in great detail. So um, I'll start with police. They have the shorter list. Uh, Charlie, if there's exceptions or changes, or if you just want to, you know, reference the titles, and I'll ask if people have questions, and we can proceed uh, uh, through in that manner. So with that, I'll give the floor to uh, Deputy Chief Charles Gibson. Good morning. Uh I'd start with the uh, the second uh, pump out boat on the Marine Department. Uh, we've got some materials, I believe, that were attached to our submission. Uh, this is just to continue to support our uh, waterways uh, cleanliness and the services that we provide are to the uh, mooring fields, all the boats out there. Uh, we have a no discharge zone, so we have to provide some pump out facilities. And this is just to uh, augment what we uh, have. We have one main pump out boat. If that boat goes down, uh, we're in trouble. So um, and most of this uh, purchase would be uh, available for reimbursement under a state grant. Uh, any changes from the uh, previous request? No. On this? No, okay. Any questions, guys? All right. Uh, what do you got next for us? Uh, again, Marine, that's the F Street bulkhead repair. This project's been out there for probably five years now. The uh, hung up in multiple years of permitting, we have finally got all our permits. And we went out to bid with the project, but of course, uh, because it took so long to get it to bid, uh, we're over budget on our bids. Uh, RBR was the low bid on that project. So we need an additional uh, supplemental funding of that, which is the 438. That's a hard number too. So uh, to get this project uh, going, we need uh, supplemental funding. Okay, thanks. Any questions, guys, at this time? All right, next. 
And then uh, the next item uh, down under police is the Laurent housing. Uh, that's the police seasonal housing, uh, the former Laurent facility. We've had the building since 1985. Uh, we've been phasing in some repairs. We're currently have bids, uh, we're gonna award a bid for repairing of the main building, the windows and sidewalling. Uh, that's a $988,000 project. We're a little short on that, but we can make that up for from our other budgets. Um, this is further infrastructure repairs to the sewer system and some internal. I just uh, would like to see that sewer struck off there a little bit. It's more of sewer and other infrastructure. It's not solely for sewer. Um, so this is for two buildings out there for lift stations and uh, sewer connections to uh, the uh, main feed that's down Low Beach Road. Okay, great. Uh, and uh, questions, anyone on this one? Peter McEcker? Uh, just an observation, Charlie. Why wouldn't you want to change the priority for your items from medium to high? Um, because right now there's a sewer system there right now. Um, the septic hasn't stopped working. We have it pumped out during the high season so we, we can get by with it. Uh, we have things that, uh, you know, when we say it's a high priority, I mean, it needs to be done absolutely today. So we tend to be a little more conservative, what we call high and low priorities. Good. Okay, thanks. Okay, and uh, your last is the uh, radio replacements. Good. The, this is for all of the uh, handheld uh, mobile radios that the police uh, and Marine Department use. The, these items, uh, we originally purchased them in, uh, from, I believe it was 15, 16 years ago now, which was a town meeting article. Um, the manufacturer Motorola has uh, announced its end of life. They're no longer going to support them. Um, so we have to start uh, phasing in those replacements. Uh, so we have 15 years out of our you know, current system of the handheld units and they call them subscribers. And uh, that, that project and that would have a high high priority because that's definitely uh, critical public safety equipment that we have to have. Okay, thanks. Um, I recall getting into the uh, previous replacements in, uh, in a lot of detail uh, when we were doing liaisons and meeting up at the uh, conference room there. So there was a lot of good information. Any questions on the uh, radio replacements this time? Okay, great. Uh, uh, Pete, uh, Christy, kick him. Yeah, uh, Charlie, is this for a uh, full replacement for all radios for officers and CSOs? Uh, eventually, yes, we phase it in. We don't, we try not to, you know, do a complete, you know, 100% replacement, but we, we, we're reply, we have to replace them. So uh, eventually it will be 100% of all the officers and CSOs, yes. And is this uh, uh, pertain to any, uh, equipment at the station as opposed to uh, equipment that either the cruisers or the people are carrying? No, this is just a, what they call subscribers, which is the uh, portable and mobile units, vehicle and handhelds. The infrastructure, we've replaced that and upgraded that over the past few years. So that system is in, in good shape. Uh, we have quite a few years of uh, lifespan on the infrastructure. These are just the uh, the units that the officers or CSOs would be using. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Richard. Uh, just a quick question: How many uh, units will this four hundred thousand buy? One hundred. One hundred. Okay. Thank you. Uh, last question, I guess, uh, Charlie. What's the anticipated useful life for these units? Um, 15, 20 years. You know, we get, uh, we do. They do hold up. That's why they're expensive. So, you know, they're each unit probably is uh, three to four thousand dollars a piece, and uh, but they last 15, 16 years. You can drop them down a flight of stairs, drop them into three feet of water, and pick them up, and they'll still work. Try great. that with a cell phone. That's great. And does, does this include like uh, software updates uh, on an annual basis? And if so, for what length of period? Um, these units. Um, come from the factor what they call firmware. The firmware is uh, guaranteed to be compatible uh, throughout the life of the system if they needed a firmware upgrade that's included for free. 
Okay, thanks. Okay, all right. Well, we appreciate that. Uh, we appreciate the supple information you provided also. Sorry, uh, not enough coffee yet this morning. It's been too busy. Um, we'll, uh, you know, our process will be reviewing these over the course of the next few weeks and start to get our rankings together for recommendations. Um, I know uh, Peter McKechnie had asked you about priority changes and that the uh, sewer had not, but have any of the priorities on any of these others changed? Just if you wanted to highlight that, this would be your shot. Well, just on the public safety radio equipment that, you know, since Motorola has given us the end of life, what that means is that they will repair up into the point of having no more parts. So certain models of radios, they have, like the uh, Marine Department radios, they've already said uh, they're not repairing them. In fact, they sent one back the other day, just so it's, it's dead. Uh, some of the higher uh, units that the officers have, um, they're on a short, uh, short lifespan as well. So as soon as they start to, to drop out, we can't get them fixed. So um, that's why replacement on that is in a higher, higher level. Okay. And Christy, did you have a follow-up? Just a quick, uh, Charlie, I was just curious if we're so far in with Motorola that that's really the only option or were there any other options for uh, equipment? Um, where the infrastructure is all Motorola, you could buy other, um, other brands of radios. They, they call it APCO 25 standard, which is a uh, public safety standard. So you could buy a Kenwood radio or a Harris. Um, the problem you run into is getting them fixed and maintaining uh, standards for the users and the features. So um, the Motorola products have served us well. They're under a state contract and uh, you know, it's, it's what we use. Very good, thanks. Okay, great. Uh, Charlie, thanks again. We appreciate your time and as I said, the additional information. Okay, thank you. Take care. All right, so uh, next up is DPW Transportation. Uh, we've got Rob McNeil, uh, uh, the Department of Public Works Director, and Andrew Vorce, our Planning Director here. So uh, with that, Rob, I'll hand the floor over to you. There's, I've got a total of nine and a couple of these have revisions, is, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, so going down uh, your list here for 22, starting with uh, cobblestone improvements, uh, 500,000 has been or at least it's been the ask. Uh, the funding in 20 was uh, cut in half. Uh, uh, just a reminder, we've been sort of, I wouldn't say we waiting, but we were uh, trying to coordinate uh, cobblestone repairs along with sidewalk repairs for areas like Upper Main Street and uh, delays due to, uh, you know, historical reviews and that sort of stuff has uh, ultimately Put us in a situation where we're out doing uh, lots of cobblestone repairs uh, out of emergency need. Uh, a lot of cobblestone uh, potholes have opened up on Upper Main Street uh, in the spring. So we are finishing up just Upper Main Street emergency repairs um, to the tune of about a million dollars. Uh, just to let folks know, I mean, this, this is expensive work. And so 500,000 is the ask, uh, just to give you a, a sense, it doesn't go very far, but uh, that's where we're at with that. Um, most of you Rob on that one. Say again. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you wrapped that up. I was just asking if there's any questions. Uh, Christy. Uh, Rob, you, uh, as, uh, are you happy with the uh, quality of the work you're getting with the cobblestone repair? Yeah, uh, we're working with the contractor to supplement stones that were missing. Uh, on previous meetings, we've described uh, how uh, projects, utility projects uh, from the 90s uh, that went up Upper Main Street, uh, in, you know, they were done by utility contractors who had the wherewithal to be able to install the conduits and such, but. Uh, not necessarily the expertise uh, to do the cobblestone repairs along the trench. So what you ended up with is instead of a, a vertically uh, axis based stone, uh, the way they're supposed to be properly set uh, and tightly against uh, the adjacent stone, uh, the contractor basically laid them flat 
uh, which served to cover more area quickly, uh, but it, it turns into an unstable surface. And so you have quite a bit of that that ran up uh, that majority of Upper Main Street. And so what we're doing now is the contractors re removing a lot of those and resetting them vertically. But in doing that, that area uh, needs to be supplemented. So we're providing them the extra cobblestones from our uh, resources to be able to, uh, to get those completed. So they're going in, the surface is gonna hold up significantly better than what's been up there simply because the process is being followed properly. Very good. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, other questions for Rob on this one at this time? Uh, Peter Kaiser. Yeah, hey Rob, uh, looks like um, there was no 2021 request for cobblestone improvements. I, I have been seeing some um, cobblestone work going on as you, as you referred Upper Main Street um, or the Pleasant Street to the Civil War Monument. Um, is that all still funding from the 2020 request or is that funding coming from elsewhere? Uh, yeah, that's getting pulled from other sources like island-wide repairs. And, yeah. and it, it brings up a good point, um, Peter. I don't believe there was no request for 21. I think it was simply pulled, if I remember correctly. I'd have to go back and double check the, the ask. But to the, to the point of, is it simply cobblestone funding or something else? I think the important piece to that is uh, what I recognized when I arrived was that we had essentially one lump item for island-wide road repairs. Mm -hmm. And we have so many different types of surfaces that it seemed a lot more appropriate for me as sort of um, a reminder to everybody, including Capcom, that there's things uh, that need to be addressed, uh, whether we get down into gravel surfaces or not. Uh, but we wanted to break those things out so that people recognize that there were some unique surfaces that uh, definitely have higher cost, uh, unit price cost. And so, uh, as opposed to just trying to look at a lump sum for island-wide road repairs and assuming it's gonna be asphalt repairs, uh, just to make sure that folks know that we are uh, funding these various types of surfaces uh, to, to do repairs when necessary. And they're not expected to cover each and everything uh, to the full extent, but at least raise awareness that we have these kind of needs. Great, yeah, it seems, seems like a prudent course of action. Uh, thanks, Rob and Peter. Rick? Yeah, just quickly, just to round out a little bit, there, there was a $250,000 appropriation for FY20 as well, in addition to the other funds that Rob was talking about. Thank you. Uh, Christy Kickham. And good morning, Christy Parentella. I didn't know if there was a, uh, I know in the past we've uh, pondered uh, making the request, um, approving the request due to uh, an existing balance in the account from say a year that not much work was done. So not sure if that was the issue, but uh, just, just throwing that out there. Okay, thanks, Christy. Um, okay, so let's see. Rob, I think, I mean, so you're putting it in for the current year request, you had it in for FY20 and uh, you figure you'll burn, just picking up on Christy's comment, you figure you'll spend through that in the fiscal year 21. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, what do you got next for us? Multi-use path maintenance. Okay. Uh, so the, uh, there's a fair amount of this that's happening and we anticipate it continuing into the future. Um, the, to a large degree, these are, uh, we've been doing our homework with the uh, bike paths Similar to the roadway inventory and asphalt condition assessments that have occurred in the past, um, the idea is that we get into a pattern of uh, roadway assessment, as, uh, asphalt assessment, and then um, getting into an alternate year of multi-use path assessments. So the report is, is pending. Uh, it should be due out uh, this late fall uh, from our uh, engineer who looked at the entire system of existing multi-use paths. And so I think in the out years, we'll have either uh, larger sums to uh, support 
the intended maintenance and upgrades to these paths as opposed to individual specific projects. And we'll sort of pick off that menu of recommended projects. I think you've seen a, a you might've seen a brief summary of that report uh, in its draft form. Thank you. Once again, uh, 250 doesn't go far. Uh, I wanted to point out that the most recent Monomoy, that uh, four day bike path, I call it, because it was built in four days from uh, the rotary up to Monomoy. That cost about uh, 240,000, uh, which is about, I'm sorry, uh, Andrew, can you correct me on that? What was that figure? It, it worked out to 240 per foot and uh, the next stretch, as we were talking about, was extending from Monomoy to Pulpus Road bike path up uh, Milestone. That's about a thousand feet, uh, so that would that would swallow that 250, essentially, um, right off the bat. So we're not. The point is, we're not going far with uh, the funding that is proposed. It's just a matter of you know using some of the stuff for uh, for uh, maintenance projects as well. And the two that we currently have under consideration that we're moving forward with in Matic, you know, we have one in Matticut and then one at the Rotary. You, you might have seen those recently uh, approved at the Select Board. Uh, those are somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 125 to 150 each. So, and, and those are just um, repairs and upgrades. Thanks, Rob. Questions for Rob on this, Peter McEcker? Hello, Rob. How many miles of uh, multi-use paths do we have on island? Approximately 35. And if you're in the private world, you do a, a reserve study based on that 35 miles times X number of feet. Um, is 250 10% of what you need on an annual basis? Or has anyone ever figured that out if you were to uh, maintain the way that they've been built? Does that help the 250? Are we kidding so ourselves? We're at a unique uh, place, Peter. I think that the the fact that the system is has been built out as as widely as it has so far. Yeah. But it was initially con uh, constructed with the the, uh, the thought process of the time, which was an eight foot bike path. Uh, times have changed over the decades, and we're now into what's called the multi-use path which is a minimum of 10 feet. Uh, we've seen an explosion of the use of bikes. People really enjoy coming here because of the extensiveness of our systems. And so we wanna give and enhance that experience. Uh, the, the point is that we're, we have a fantastic infrastructure. Most of our system is really high quality asphalt conditions. So we wanna not just maintain that, but we wanna widen the path at the same time. There are certainly, paths that are in, uh, I won't say dire, but more uh, uh, fundamentally, they might have root intrusions or stuff like that that have developed over years. There's some cracking and that sort of thing that needs to be actually what I would call maintained or preventative maintained. But we're gonna be focusing a lot on uh, widening the old bike paths from eight to 10 feet uh, when we do those kind of updates. And this, so I think the point to that is instead of just uh, moving these along and trying to keep them uh, up to speed and, and in good condition, we're, we're looking at some pretty substantial upgrades at the same time, or I would say costly linear uh, projects that are, that are gonna um, add up pretty quickly. All right, so, so my question still wasn't answered. In advocating for these multi-use paths is what I'm doing. Is two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year adequate, or are we kidding ourselves that that may hypothetically only get us twenty miles of, of coverage, so to speak, in the in the time period that we're working on paths? So, is is two fifty a good number on an annual basis, or does it need to go higher? I think two fifty is going to go higher. It's a okay. this is a, a good spot for me to start and say I need something to get moving, but the report because the report's pending. I don't have anything to say, it's 2.5. So one would think that not only 
us here in the Capcom or the select board or the FinCom or whoever, just the, the, the uh, residents, we should know from a reserve study standpoint, what we're embarking on before we say, let's do this and do that. And, and, that, and that way we make sure we're, we're doing the right thing financially and, and uh, addressing it and throwing the right numbers at it. So I would, uh, I would think we'd want to work a little bit more and advocate the right dollars. So if it isn't 250, we should be able to come up with what it is. And so then based, on, say, based on a private reserve, then you look at the, the future cost of money because today's cart path or multi-use path is based on a square footage and then you, you, know, you play with it over the years. Sure. So the, the thought process on the, the two point, uh, the, the 250 rather, is essentially that we're going to uh, take a look at addressing the worst of the uh, sections that are out there first. Uh, there's some, and we do have a, a section uh, map that the engineer has provided as well. Um, so in the, in the short term, um, of the of the entire mileage, just to give you a sense, uh, we have almost forty percent of the bike paths that are coming back in their existing conditions uh, that there's no maintenance recommended. That's that's really strong. That's, well, that's good to know that. Yeah, um, fifty three percent falls into a routine maintenance category, and then the remainder is into a preventative maintenance. And so each of those uh, carry uh, different levels of cost associated with them. And so the, the point is that 250 is gonna help us do required maintenance on some smaller stretches that are in tough shape to give us a much, much smoother surface. And my point is that moving out beyond 22 will have a lot more uh, information and to develop what I would call a a short-term robust investment, reinvestment into our existing path system to upgrade it to multi-use paths. Yeah. And then we'll, uh, I, would get, I would guess we would transition from that next short-term and uh, more intense investment into a more preventative type of maintenance longer term that might bring us back to that 250 range annually. Great, thank you very much. You're welcome. Any other questions for Rob on this one? Okay, uh, I, uh, Peter took the words out of my mouth. I think the reserve aspect and having the inventory uh, indexed to the different levels of maintenance is a great tool. And uh, uh, we appreciate the fact you're working on that, Rob. Um, I would say that uh, this will probably develop to the point where, you know, it'll be, well, I, I did some quick numbers. It's a fairly substantial number depending on the amount of new paving that's done. Um, and I think that it's an important aspect of what Nantucket's about. This might even be something that falls into like a, the legacy category um, in terms of how the community uh, feels and does business. You know, bike paths are a big part of our identity and the interconnectedness. So it's a big priority. And I guess I'm trying to say is uh, we appreciate you working to get a, a better breakdown for the future. Um, we appreciate you putting this in to get the maintenance going and some of the expansion going. And uh, I think we'll look forward to additional information on this to, uh, to you know, make recommendations on. So thanks on that, Rob. What do you got next? Uh, Newtown Road. Newtown New Road? Is this a new project? Newtown Road is, uh, was a, a project that uh, was, it failed at the ballot. Uh, and it's it's back on just for consideration, assuming that the select board uh, selected for the warrant uh, and support this continued uh, effort here. But it's part of the select board strategic plan in uh, transportation goals of connecting uh, pedestrian connections to uh, from 6FG housing project to the ferries. And so that's that's a big big deal here. Uh, we've done the interim short-term measures already, introducing the speed tables 
um, to, to slow people down uh, that important cut through. And this would essentially allow us to do uh, sidewalk or multi-use path introduction uh, and to do the road completely over from um, fairgrounds to um, Cooper Farm Road. Thank you. So no changes in scope. It's just a, it's a re-up of the article if the select board endorse it. Correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions for Rob on this one? Uh, Richard? You're Rob, muted. Rob, I, I know that uh, this is not your area, but um, after the, uh, it was voted down, um, I had a chance to talk to a resident of the road and um, the residents on the road had no idea what was going on. So I would just hope that um, when we go forward with this again, that we do a better job of educating in particular the people that live on the road so they know what's going on. I mean, residents voted it down because they didn't know what was going on. Just an observation. I could appreciate that. And Thank you, Richard. That's helpful. Public outreach is, is certainly key in any of these projects. Um, I know that the town administration office uh, and, and all of the departments uh, support those efforts to get the word out uh, of what people are actually voting on uh, when they do go to an, uh, a town meeting or uh, election. And so I think, or a town meeting. So I think the, uh, the point of the public outreach to the specific residents along the corridors uh, that generally occurs when the project is uh, approved to move forward and uh, to, to in the development of the details and how we handle each property. But that, that will certainly be something um, that we will move forward. And this project was certainly initiated by residents uh, of the street. Uh, they've been, I have been privy to every communication, but I know that residents on the street, and I believe at least a commercial business owner uh, have been very vocal uh, with town administration uh, to improve this, this cut through. But I, I appreciate where you're coming from, Richard. And Thank we, you. all these projects would definitely include uh, public outreach quite specific to uh, the, the residents and abutters there. Okay, uh, Peter Kaiser. Yeah, hey, uh, Rob, do we have any kind of engineered kind of conceptualization of, of how this is going to look at this point or just the um, kind of overhead GIS um, satellite view with the green line in it that's in the sub supplemental documents? I, I do not have that, but uh, Andrew May, I th think I remember something that uh, Mike Burns had developed. Uh, for a conceptual look at this because there was even, I believe there was a selected side for the sidewalk or multi-use path. Uh, I want to remember it was the north side, but. Uh, yeah, the, the, the one I'm looking at has on the north side. I mean, it's just a green kind of line that shows yep. where it'll be. I didn't know if there's anything more, um, you know, uh, kind of graphically drawn up or anything like that. Um, Not that I'm aware of. Okay, gotcha, thanks. Okay, any other questions on that one? Okay, I don't know if you saw it pop up on the screen, but um, uh, town admin mentions that it was not only voted down, but it was in the middle of the uh, pandemic, which kind of stalled out the ability to get information out um, on this. So I think it's a, I agree, Christy had chatted in, it's a good point. So, um, and Peter, I agree with you. I think visual aid is, is really important. Um, the, the picture of the uh, fire truck coming down the lane, um, it, to me, I understand what the issue is there, but to someone else, they may not completely understand what that means. So um, any visual aids that could be uh, brought up would be helpful. I think this is, personally, I think this is a really important project for the community in that area. And um, anyone who travels um, from one side who skips around the rotary Due to their location, uh, it, that 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 road is problematic for a variety of reasons. Um, so, in any event, uh, thanks, Rob, on that one. What do you got for us next? Uh, next, we're looking at uh, the permanent traffic counting stations. Uh, okay. The first one was installed uh, and is waiting for its fiber connection. 
but uh, right now the first one is up there at uh, Orange Street at uh, Goose Pond. These are based on the pricing has been adjusted uh, based on actual costs. Uh, so we're looking for 175 um, as a realistic cost estimate moving forward with these, and we would adjust them as you know they generally they've taken about a full year soup to nuts on design and construction. So um, we would adjust the out years uh, depending on the situation. I would say one of the potential cost differentials or plus or minus on these is gonna be getting fiber uh, to those locations to be able to support the data stream. But I'll continue to work with uh, the planning office to locate these. Uh, generally, Mike Burns and I had spent quite a bit of time looking at points of interest uh, that traffic data has been counted in the past historically. And so we are working through some of those locations and trying to pick off uh, what makes the most sense. Uh, so the first one's there on Orange Street along the truck route. Uh, the second one is expected to be uh, brought out to the entrance to the landfill, uh, which arguably brings you know a, a great deal, a majority of the uh, island's traffic, uh, both to the landfill facility itself, as well as the uh, fluctuating daily traffic out to uh, watch that beautiful Madigan sunset. So it would give us lots of good uh, traffic data. Thanks, Rob. Questions for Rob on this one? Peter Kaiser? Uh, you're, mute. you're muted, Peter. Yeah, hey, thanks, Rob. So it looks like we have one of these in every out year out for the next, you know, six years, give or take. Do we have a maximum number of these that we plan on installing or is it, is it gonna be one a year until we have, you know, 20, 30, 40? We talked about probably six of these. Okay, like gotcha. I will be honest with you, Peter. I think it's it's a matter of how successful this program becomes, okay. and what you know, including conversations that we're having about you know what do we do with the data, mm -hmm. uh, and that's an important question to have when we're just starting out. Uh, lots of different systems uh, do things differently. Good. Boston. Good. You know, for instance, Boston has a, a wonderful uh, data sharing effort. Uh, they have a completely separate department that just deals with uh, IT related uh, data development projects, but because they share everything, uh, they, they often have uh, even like contests for folks to just uh, delve into the data and come back with, you know, uh, results and uh, interesting things that we may not know. So I think there's an opportunity certainly for that. I think uh, here, the other is, or do we monetize it? You know, does it become some kind of, um, you know, cash cow for us just to, to, uh, to work into either future uh, contracts for vendors that are providing data analytics for us uh, or some other way? So it's, we're, we're trying to explore all of that before we really go fully live with this. And it's, a, I will say it's a bit challenging considering we don't have our transportation planner position filled. Um, you know, keep getting that input. Uh, we've largely relied on uh, outside consultants for uh, a lot of input on this. <laughs> Great, thank you. Thanks guys. Uh, any other questions for I'm Rob gonna, on this one? I'm gonna go. Peter McEachern. Well, because you mentioned it, Rob. Rob, does it make sense? Uh, I'm sure you and Andrew have looked at the cost of, of bringing back a new traffic plan versus continually subbing out as need be. And, and sometimes it's the frustration of, of creating a plan, putting good thought into it, regardless if we have an employee on staff versus an outside contractor, and then when it gets to the general public, and they vote it down. I'm sure all that's gone through both of your minds. If you want to comment, you don't have to. Um, I, I have lots of thoughts on it. I will say this. I believe that there is, there's always going to be room for a transportation planner because there's just, uh, 
you know, there's, there's, it's a tough job, obviously. There's a, there's a real um, push uh, locally to try to manage what we can given the, the tools available. Uh, but uh, I think the challenge is when you bring in any outside consultants, you know, the first thing that the transportation planner locally uh, would educate them on is uh, take half of the tools or three quarters of the tools that you're bringing with you from off island and throw them away. And, and that's a real challenge, as you know, Peter. I, I, so I think that Mike was super successful at what he did uh, because he had that wherewithal uh, that the only lights that we would see here on the island would be at the car wash, you know? I, I would just add, uh, remember that the transportation planner is paid for 100% from state funds because we are a regional planning agency. So there is no local funding that uh, pays for that position. Um, we did advertise it and got exactly zero uh, interest. Um, that was during, I guess, the waning time of the uh, pandemic when it was first announced. So we are re-advertising that, but um, I think, I think as Rob and I uh, can attest, losing that 40 hours is, um, you know, has been a big burden for us to pick up and we need that position back. No, amen. I mean, I applaud. I think Mike was phenomenal for us. I just felt frustrated for him and for everyone else that, that worked with him. Yep. All right, guys, I, I want to thank you. I want to bring it back to topic, though. So um, wireless uh, on the uh, traffic cameras, Rob, does this just uh, does it do traffic counts? Does it also tally in? Is there some algorithm or something that addresses weights of vehicles? Um, so we have an idea of those types of things. Yes. So currently, uh, the system that we have purchased and spec for this is a counter. Uh, the nice thing is, the, and the, the big upgrade from what was currently being done with, uh, the, with Mike's uh, strips that you'd often see periodically placed across the street on the pavement. Um, we're going from doing it seasonally uh, for a week or two uh, to continuous counting 24 seven, number one. And number two, uh, the difference between a count and a classification uh, makes a huge difference. Uh, if you're not specifically sitting there um, indicating the number of uh, motorcycles, passenger vehicles or trucks to get a real uh, uh, understanding of the mix of the classification of the vehicles, uh, then you're using standardized uh, estimates. And so what this actually allows us to do, because it's a visual counter, that it uh, essentially, it, it has learning software, uh, but it has, I, f I forget how many it was, it was something insane, the, the database of vehicles uh, that are pre-programmed into the software for instant uh, video recognition. So basically the computer uh, will will see a vehicle and classify it as essentially a motorcycle uh, up through a tractor trailer truck and be able to count it and classify it. So it will do uh, pedestrians, it'll do bicyclists, and it will do um, any kind of vehicles. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's taking what we, what we had done in the past and really modernizing that, uh, it's, it's really enriching uh, the data that we are gathering, and we're going to be doing it around the clock. Okay, thank you. No, it's just helpful. Uh, and then the other thing I just wanted to uh, throw out there, I, I'm sure you guys are thinking about it, but with the concept of the town uh, developing a, a Wi-Fi mesh approach, uh, there may be some, maybe there isn't a cost savings, but it may be that if Wi-Fi units were available that were, you know, they have two models. One is a one is a hardwired and one is a Wi-Fi or a hardwired. Uh, it might be beneficial uh, to be uh, uh, conceiving of solutions that would involve the Wi-Fi um, because it may give us an opportunity to be, um, if we were 
strategically developing both of those together and not that traffic count should be determining where the Wi-Fi goes. But um, I think reasonably, we, you know, that we as a community could be getting data in areas that we might not be thinking of it because it would be too difficult to lay the landline. Um, I believe you said a landline is, you know, there's a, a, a wire required for these of some type, Rob. So this is, uh, to, just to clarify, this has both Wi-Fi and uh, fiber. Great, thank you. Yep. Okay, any, um, any other questions for Rob on this? All right. Um, just to clarify, with respect to um, employee positions, I'm totally good with this. I think it's appropriate. I, I want to be clear on this because it's important, not on this particular topic, but overall, you know, one of the one of the elements that we review is whether there are personnel costs involved with um, a particular request. Um, I have, you know, I support discussion on those things. I just don't want to veer off into broader topics of whether a position is warranted or not. It's really not our purview. So that's all I meant by bringing this back on topic. Um, as far as I'm concerned, any, any question is fair game and then we can kind of parlay through it. Um, next up, Rob, is I have road improvements. Yes. So uh, for island-wide road improvements, uh, more to the point of uh, something that was brought up earlier, about is you know is whatever the previous funding uh, that's been asked for still appropriate, and I think we have enough data now to show us that uh, the roadway improvements and the asks that come up politically throughout the year um, really require us to go outside or you know th there's a lot more demand than there is funding uh, to be able to get a lot of roadway improvement projects completed. Uh, so we are looking to better or more adequately fund based on, you know, what we have back uh, in the backlog. Uh, the, the consultant that we have that's put together our, uh, the attachment there for the road, the, this is basically asphalt or the roadway um, the uh, pavement condition assessment. And so we use that data to be able to uh, look at and prioritize projects. But then when we start to add on things like other utilities that need to be repaired uh, and working with their prioritization plans, as well as uh, couple that with the sidewalk programs. Uh, and now, you know, sidewalks, we have sort of three complementary, but in some ways competing uh, sidewalk programs where we have the historically sensitive uh, sidewalk program in town. We now have the select board strategic plan sidewalk uh, ask uh, for a, a strategic connection between 6FG and the ferries. And we also have the roads and right of way folks uh, that are looking to prioritize other important connections in town, such as Prospect Street or William Street. So things like that that are going on. And, and Andrew and I spend a tremendous amount of time working with these and trying to figure out what makes sense to bring to bear and, and when. Um, I think the pavement condition assessment plan is super helpful to help us uh, look to see where the, the, the most efficient use of our asphalt investment goes, but there's so many other interests to be considered. Uh, we, we start with that and, and work uh, sort of backwards. So th the most beneficial, I think, would be the cost benefit value analysis with the cumulative total. Uh, there's three sheets and it basically lists uh, all the way out for a uh, basically a 2.85 uh, budget. Uh, so the ask here is uh, just a bit more than that, the 3.8, I'm sorry, 3 point, yeah, 3.8. And the idea is just, it gives us more bandwidth to do um, a lot more roadway and related work. Thanks, Rob. Uh, Christy Kickham. Rob, do you anticipate with this amount and going forward that you'd be carrying a balance every year? And uh, do you know if there is an existing balance? Um, if there is an existing balance, I know we've been burning through 
to cover some of the cobblestone repairs. Uh, I would certainly hope not to have a balance uh, and to burn through all of it, Christy. And to be totally frank, uh, I think the out years would certainly depend on, you know, the, the, the future asks would certainly depend on this. I hope to test the contractors to be able to get to a point where we're not just pumping out work to pump it out, but pumping out quality work that holds up over time and, and be able to discover what our capacity truly is to construct. Uh, this year, I think we, we were able to do a lot of work in the summer uh, where traditionally we have not been able to. So uh, it's my hope that we are able to continue to do those uh, where it makes sense and is somewhat sensitive to uh, obviously the explosion of uh, tourists uh, and visitors here. So I think that's it's a realistic number to shoot for. And I think, you know, in the next couple of years, I really hope to understand specifically, you know, what our capacity is. Thanks. Uh, Christy Kickham. Just to follow up, um, would it be um, uh, beneficial or not to, because uh, you said you were using some funds for some sidewalk repair to bundle those two uh, line items? Give you some flexibility uh, either way with, with the funds. It's. I would say, I think there's some discussions um, above my pay grade on uh, doing something like that. Uh, I'm not sure if that's gonna be from uh, a roadway sidewalk type of approach or uh, municipal facility repairs and preventative maintenance projects. Uh, it's certainly worth considering. I think my approach in the past has been to uh, to go for some lump sums here, but to break out within those where the some of the expected work is going to be. I mean, and I share all the time with people like I, I can bring to you a plan, uh, but then when we start to go down the path of where we're actually going to spend those dollars, unless there's a very specific breakout of it's this project, um, that I'll call it that discretionary pot of authorization uh, does get pushed around quite a bit. Fair answer, Rob, thank you. Uh, Christy, did you have a follow-up? No, okay. Uh, any other questions for Rob on this? So Rob, um, I, look, I appreciate the uh, PMP, the pavement management plan. I think that that's a great tool um, my concern with respect to recommendations on this is, is not that it's um, too much or it should be split, is that it's, uh, frankly, I don't think it's sufficient. Um, I'm looking at you know, the, the management plan, I'm looking at the backlog, uh, and I'm looking at preventive maintenance, which is you know, about a million six, um, not to mention routine maintenance, which is about another 480,000. And with the way I come at these types of things is with preventive maintenance, a, a dollar now spent is a savings of one or two or maybe more dollars later. So, um, I mean, I just wanna have said that because I think it's an important aspect. We've invested uh, through your leadership in this area in this plan. And I think we need to uh, be using it as a tool to be making decisions. Um, it's not our place to make the decisions, but I think it's important that we are looking at what our costs are at a 10 year uh, window and um, not addressing preventive maintenance that we know needs to be done in full and catching up on the backlog is our dollars that we are um, uh, inflating over time that we will have to spend. Now, of course, all of that is against the backdrop of there are other priorities within the community. I understand that. But um, I think that, that uh, the PMP is a good tool and I hope we'll rely on that more. Thank you. Thank you. That was a statement, not a question. Um, what else you got for us, Rob? Uh, so transitioning into sidewalk improvements. Um, I kind of spelled out a little bit of where I was at with uh, the previous discussion about roads, but uh, so we're looking for uh, just over the million inflated uh, 3% per year uh, for 22. 
And, and that's kind of where I'm at with the, again, the, the different interests out there. Uh, we, we're trying to do as much as we can in town, uh, carrying out the, the plan initiated through uh, PLUS, which is essentially moving from the waterfront out. Uh, so far, you know, recently just the Washington Street um, uh, Square area and Salem Street area. So we still have a bit on Candle Street, but the primary focus next is uh, Easy Street and then turn the corner on Lower Broad. Um, that, that's where we're gonna be going next. And then we'll be doing all the perpendicular streets up to uh, South Water and then South Water and, and continuing. So as, as much of that as we can uh, bite off and chew, uh, we'll be able to get done. In, and why I bring it up as three sort of different uh, competing or, or simultaneous interests, uh, we have this the select board strategic plan uh, for the connection from 6FG to the boats, uh, which is primarily going to be, you know, uh, Pleasant Street or um, combination of that with Orange um, and uh, Union and Washington. So we have projects that are imagined. They start to be conceptualized like a Washington Francis, for instance. And we, we get the green light from the select board to move forward with a project like that. But then when we start digging deeper and asking around for other utilities to uh, jump into that project so we don't go spend money to improve the surface only to then rip it up with a utility project. So uh, water is uh, one that needs to do work in Washington Street. And, and then on top of that, uh, so the nice thing is that the communications and power have just been updated or upgraded or just moved over to the new poles for the L8 project uh, that National Grid brought to bear. Sewer is generally in good shape in that general area, but water needs to be replaced. I have some drainage work that I could get done during this process, but the, the bigger picture is the Coastal Resiliency uh, advisory Committee uh, and their recent recommendations that were adopted uh, uh, as policy by the select board, uh, which is basically each and every coastal project that occurs needs to now be designed with sea level rise in mind. So what started as, you know, the back of a napkin, let's improve the truck route uh, to mirror the Francis Union Street improvements with the curved, nice curved inbound surface. So we're looking at doing a nice curved outbound from Washington to Francis is now looking at uh, allowing these other things to uh, uh, accumulate and become a much more effective, larger project, which would be sidewalk improvements, roadway improvements, improvements to the water system, uh, and raising the profile of Washington Street uh, to protect us a bit more uh, with the uh, ongoing and uh, rising sea level. So it turns from a, you know, whatever the project was going to cost into something far more substantial. And uh, in my opinion, makes a whole lot of sense to, to handle it this way, but it, it, I don't have a placeholder even uh, at this point because it's still a work in progress uh, conceptually. But we're here to talk about sidewalks and sidewalks, um, again, this is in town and then the strategic plan connection from 6FG to, to downtown to the ferries, as well as these other important uh, connections that are out of town, but uh, such as Prospect Street and some of the uh, some of those other areas that the Roads and Right of Way Committee have been working very hard to prioritize. The, so it's a million dollar ask. I would I, I could conceivably see some of the out years going into like a million dollars per category uh, to be able to do as much of those uh, as we can. And if they're done in a vacuum as just sidewalk improvements. That's great, but if there's any other roadway improvements or others, having having uh, authorizations that are available to draw from uh, to support projects uh, as they come up is it, it's, it's an important tool for me to have. 
Christy Keiko. Rob, uh, when you do the sidewalk improvements and you guys um, work on those, are you uh, conferring with say, oops, sorry about that. Sorry, you're muted. Sorry. Are you conferring with, uh, you know, the trucking companies, the fire station, uh, on, you know, particularly when the sidewalk? Sorry, you broke up after you said fire station. So uh, I think what Christy had asked was whether you're conferring with fire department and other departments uh, when you're doing the improvements or prior to in the design stage. Christy, you were breaking up. I know it. I got a call right at the same time. Uh, so, trucking uh, companies, especially when you're expanding uh, or widening sidewalks. So when we are looking at uh, widening sidewalks, I'll talk specifically about in town. Uh, in town, those are those are basically general public forums that we hold uh, to get input. Uh, the ones we've had in the past, the public information sessions I've held uh, have in, involved specific mailings to abutters uh, along those areas. So we get area businesses and other people involved. Uh, there's been all kinds of different participation levels uh, and from all walks of life to those uh, areas. Uh, we do, the engineers involved, in, uh, take a look at the needs of the trucks and we do we have reached out to a number of different uh, businesses through the years to get input on what is necessary what's needed uh, and we try to take those into account for uh, the, the turning movements along the truck route sp specifically uh, police and fire certainly all the departments uh, have their own internal review and comment period and we've you know we, we through the years, we've worked on getting some kind of uh, basic checklists to make sure that if we're looking at things like raised table crosswalks or uh, those kind of things that, you know, emergency services certainly have uh, the ability to weigh in and, uh, and to provide comments on those. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Rob. Christy, any other questions on this one? I will say one thing to point out that wasn't specifically talked about there, Christy, was the truck lengths. Um, as the, you know, if you've, if you've been off island much and really paid attention to the trucks, the trucks have gotten bigger. Uh, and we do see some really extra uh, large loads here. Uh, they, I know through the years, just from hearing from people, uh, there's been some challenging uh, special loads that have actually had to be uh, craned around some corners uh, downtown uh, to be able to make it out of uh, Broad Street. So we definitely need to pay attention to, you know, what I don't think there's much in the in the idea of um, limitations on what the steamship uh, will be able to take and specialty vehicles for deliveries of uh, specialty houses and those kind of and, and equipment needs uh, that the island's going to have, whether it's the national grid uh, uh, generator system out there or other specialty equipment that comes to the island. Uh, we're we're going to try to keep that stuff in, in mind as much as possible. Thank you. Okay, good. All right, Rob, uh, we're moving down to the Surfside Area Roads, phase two, I think. Yes. Um, I would say this kind of starts with what's in a name. Um, Surfside Area Roads has been sort of on the capital list here for well before I got here. And uh, this really should, we could boil it down as Lover's Lane. Uh, so Surfside Area Roads reconstruction phase one was Boulevard. Phase two was supposed to be Okawar Monahansett. Uh, but to get to Okawar from Boulevard, you, you have a stretch of Lover's Lane. Uh, so we looked at Lover's Lane and decided that was also an excellent opportunity. We, we had a massive, uh, we have an ongoing, you know, major drainage concerns along Lover's Lane. And it's an important uh, connection for uh, bicycles as well. So looping that whole area, 
makes a lot of sense. Lover's Lane was added to the Okawamani Hansett for the phase two project. And then because Lover's Lane is actually a gravel road currently uh, and would serve as a construction route for the future Okawamani Hansett project uh, detour route, uh, Lover's Lane was selected to be the, the first piece of those three uh, to be improved. So uh, this 3.2 is the, the portion of the project of the roughly 6.5 of the, of the entire cost of the expected Lover's Lane Okawamani Hansen project to cover just the Lover's Lane piece of this. This one also failed at the ballot. I believe uh, 16 votes. Okay, thanks, Rob. Questions for Rob on this project? Peter Kaiser? Yeah, this might be a dumb question, but is Lover's Lane a, a public way or a private, private road? Uh, it is public. Uh, I think Andrew could quote, I think it goes back to the 1800s. Right, 1892 county layout. 1892, got it, thank you. All right, All right. thanks Rob. Uh, what's next? Uh, so we have weight drive. This is a supplemental uh, from previous authorizations. The uh, 3.027 is based on uh, the latest number that just came in a month ago from our engineer, uh, finishing up the final design for weight drive. Uh, and that has been submitted for a, a grant opportunity through, I, I believe it's Mass DOT's, I can't remember the name of the program. Andrew, you might, you might weigh in there if you know the name of the program. No, but it's, I don't it, know. Anyway, all right. Well, it's, a, uh, it's a program that supports uh, housing projects similar to the uh, 6FG project as well. So uh, we've asked for, um, I, I want to say 2.75 of the 3.2. Andrew might have some details on that. No. Maybe just not at hand. Um, sorry, okay. I'm, I'm sorry. What did I miss there? Uh, so the weight drive project, what is the grant, the, the DOT grant that we applied for there? Uh, it's, um, uh, mass works. Mass works. Thank you. Yep. And it's largely in support of, uh, housing projects similar to this. Correct. Right. And it's, I, I our amount I think was that we applied for was two and a half. Yeah. Thereabouts. Yep. And that was just submitted, uh, First time we've submitted on that. So we'll see how it goes. Yep. Uh, and the far end of weight drive is the two FG parking lot. Um, if you've been out there recently, that is currently under reconstruction by DPW. So we're expanding that. And I know uh, Chief Pittman is working with town admin uh, to reimagine what that will be uh, when it's completed. But we're expanding that. I don't have the specs on that, but we're expanding that by uh, quite a few uh, potential parking spaces. Thanks, Rob. Uh, Richard? Rob, what's the realistic timeline for when this project will have a shovel on the ground? For weight drive? Yeah. Uh, I would say we could average, and the plans are, the, the plans that I saw just recently are, I would say our construction are bid ready. Uh, we now have the construction estimate. I, I would say as soon as we have funding in place, we could, this will go out to bid. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions for Rob on this one this time? Okay. Uh, Rob, I think all we have left is uh, Sconset Bridge. Yes. So Sconset Bridge is based on a, so it's 100,000 ask. It's uh, based on a 2017 uh, structural engineering report. 
Uh, I would say the grand majority of the recommendations included, uh, well, there was a combination of things, foundational in nature, as well as the uh, bridge deck itself. The bridge deck was the most severe work and those uh, were completed with town forces uh, back in 17. Uh, this, uh, to, if you remember, uh, when I first arrived, uh, I closed uh, two of the three bridges in town. Uh, Sconset footbridge was closed uh, right, bef the, right before Daffodil weekend. Um, and so we, uh, we, we were able to reopen it. I think, I, I don't remember the dates exactly, but we got it reopened as quickly as we could. Uh, and we brought some design elements to it that uh, really enhanced the safety out there. So this is to kind of finish up the recommendations from that report that include uh, some, uh, some of the pier, the, there's some rotted piers uh, down by the foundation and trying to get some of that work done. I think this is just based on uh, uh, back and forth with the engineer of what the appropriate level of funding would be to complete the repairs. Okay, thank you, Rob. Uh, questions for Rob on this one? Okay, great. Well, Rob, look, we appreciate the information and your time putting this together. Andrew, you also, um, we'll be, uh, you know, our process will be discussing and ranking and coming up with a recommendation. And uh, if we have any supplemental questions, we'll follow up uh, through staff and let you know. Great. Thanks Thank so much. Thank you very much for everyone's time. Take care. All right, guys. So uh, we don't have much left here. Uh, update on the SIP request, Rick, do you want to uh, update on the uh, access for the uh, FinCom and the select board? Sorry. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, um, it's ready. Finally, um, I um, need to set up this, the three members of the select board that do not currently have access to, to the software and we'll send out a note with login details and, um, an invitation for a little Zoom tutor tutorial with Rick, if they so choose. Um, Stephen, why don't you maybe, if you, Brian has looked through it, I've looked through it, the developers looked through it, I think it's it's tight. All the FinCom or Select Board will see is CRFs that are in Capcom status, no ability to see any Rory's, no ability to, to do anything other. Any, any button you push takes you back to the same place, which is the CRF. So. Um, I think we've got it exactly where we, I hope we have it exactly where we want it, but another set of eyes would be great. Um, and I'll get the communications out by close of business tomorrow. Okay, that's great. We really appreciate it. I think, that, <clears throat> excuse me, I think it's going to be a useful tool. Um, there'll be some growing pains. I bet you're looking forward to the tutorial with Rick. Um, but I think once uh, FinCom members and select board members understand what they can access with that, if they have a particular question, I think it's going to go a long way in answering questions in advance. Along those lines, uh, real quick, Rick, uh, they will have, when you say access to the CRF, so basically any of the tabs, including the supplemental docs? Especially, yes. yes. Perfect. Yeah, that'll be awesome. All right, well, look, we appreciate your work on that. I know uh, trying to get through with the database folks can be difficult. We're not their only priority. Um, any uh, updates from uh, committee reports, anything from the select board or NP and EDC that Capcom would want to be aware of. Um, good to the order. Uh, on the radar, we're going to be focusing on uh, getting our Rory's completed. Uh, we'll talk uh, more in detail on that next week. And uh, if anyone would like assistance with the mechanics of that, I'm happy to help. Uh, shoot me an email. Um, won't discuss uh, topics of the, of the uh, particular request, but the mechanics. Uh, just for open meeting and whatnot. Uh, reminder, we've been invited to join to a joint meeting. Um, it's, you know, to the extent, I'm not quite sure how we're going to handle 20 people in a meeting, but uh, a joint meeting November 17th. Uh, more on that later. Uh, date of our next meeting is Thursday, October 29th at 10, so next Thursday. Uh, we've got no minutes at this point to review. And um, with that, I'd ask at 1115 for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Peter, thank you. On your motion? Aye. Peter McEachern? Aye. Christy Kickham? Aye. Christy Ferentella? Aye. Richard Hussey? Aye. 
and myself. Hey, thanks everybody. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good weekend.